Hi, and welcome to this lecture on explicit instruction. So within science, we have two main types of lessons that we teach. We have content lessons that we teach in classrooms, and we have laboratory experiments investigations that we conduct in the laboratory. So if we deal with the content lessons, because that will be a large part of your actual teaching as a science teacher, there are two main ways that we can approach that, uh, those kinds of lessons. We can either stand at the front like I am right now and use a very transmissive mode of teaching with information just heading in one direction or by using a lecture. Now, if you have more time, what I recommend is that you use this particular strategy to structure your lessons. Okay? So, for today's lecture, by the end of this, you should be able to explain each phase of explicit instruction. Not only that, but you should be able to describe the purpose of each phase because the ultimate goal of all of this is for you to utilise this particular strategy within your lesson planning, especially for lessons where you want them to be uh, more active learning based as opposed to transmissive teaching based, which is what I'm doing right now. Okay. So before we, get, before we get started, I just want to introduce you to a couple of readings to help broaden your understanding of explicit instruction. Okay. So we have an article up there, explicit instruction. So uh, John Hattie, he wrote a little bit about this um, and actually he wrote it up in, in his big piece that everybody talks about in education. So definitely check that website out. If you want to check out the actual text written by Anita and Charles, then check, check out this link up, um, the link up here and go check that book out in the library. Now you can actually see Anita Archer herself talking in that video there. So all three of these uh, texts uh, uh, form part of your reading for this particular lecture. So let's get started um, with explicit instruction. So explicit instruction in a nutshell is a model of teaching where we gradually over time, over the period of a lesson, we hand the responsibility of learning over to the student. So you can see in that diagram there that if we start on the left and we proceed to the right, a lot of what happens at the beginning of a lesson is modelling by the teacher. The teacher is at the front, the reader modelling a skill. If you're a HPE teacher, uh, um, shooting basketballs, or you might be modelling how to apply Pythagoras' theorem if you're a mathematics teacher, or you might be a science teacher and you might be modelling how to use a microscope. It is very much all teacher-centred and the information is just heading in one direction. Over time, what happens then is that we enter a phase of guided practice. That is, and it starts off with teacher and students working very, very closely together, but over time, as that triangle uh, denotes, the responsibility of the teacher in this equation diminishes and the responsibility of the student eventually increases so that by the end of the teaching period we have the ultimate goal of students working independently or performing the skill independently, recalling information independently. Okay? So that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Now those three phases can be boiled down into the saying, I do, we do, you do. Okay? So I'll just come back here. So the first part there with the modelling is very much the teacher doing a lot of work. That's the I do, I am doing work as a teacher. The we do component there is the guided practice. That's where the teacher's still very much involved in the uh, formation of that particular behaviour. And the independence part of this arrow indicates the you do. That's where theoretically students are working independently by themselves. Now, there are variations on this, this uh, theme. So we can go from I do, we do, you do, to I do, we do, they do, you do. So this then incorporates an element of collaborative learning. So the two first two phases are still very much the same. So the first phase, I do, being very much teacher-centred, mo very much modelling at the front of a class and thinking out loud then there is still that participatory um, segment 
of the lesson where for example the teacher might be calling on students responses or asking students what should I do next or having the students correct their technique if they're performing a skill because they're a HPE teacher. Where this particular innovation takes over is that the collaboration between students is an important part of the process before students then move into the independent phase working purely by themselves. Okay? So that is a variation. Whether you use I do, we do, you do or I do, we do, they do, you do is completely up to you and you may vary it. Yeah? So obviously the uh, I do, we do, you do, the three phase is shorter than this one here. So you might choose to incorporate this four phase implementation of explicit instruction if you have a slightly longer lesson or if your goal is to have students collaborating and talking to one another. Right. So that's all well and good for HPE or for maths or for woodwork and metalwork where it's quite obvious that there's a skill being demonstrated. But how do we do this in science, in content lessons in particular, when we're not physically demonstrating something? Well, here's the answer. So just as always, you would go about creating your learning objective based upon a content descriptor. Sometimes those content descriptors have been already turned into learning objectives for you. Sometimes you'll rock up to a school, you are the new head of science, and it is your job to actually do that because the last person took all of their work with them. So however you derive your learning objective, a learning objective needs to be created. So part of that learning objective, you will have had use a cognitive verb. Now, using your course text, the beginner's companion, uh, beginning teacher's companion, it, this actually maps cognitive verbs to thinking tools for you. So for example, if you are going to have students compare and contrast, then your go-to maps, uh, go-to tools, will be a Venn diagram or say a double bubble. Okay? Once you have learning objective and your thinking tool, then it's time to find a piece of text and tailor the piece of text if it's age inappropriate, for example. Um, now, whether you choose the tool before the text or the text before the tool is really going to change from situation to situation. The ordering of those two things really doesn't matter. What is more important is that you have your learning objective. Once you have your tool and your text, the way that you can incorporate explicit instruction is by completing, say, the first row if you're using a table. Or, say, uh, if you're using a mind map, then you might actually identify the, the main branches that students are to use. And then you can, for the, the we do, you can have students suggest what sub-branches get added to those major branches and then students then work independently on ad adding the tertiary branches to those. So there's a whole different, uh, there's a whole range of different ways that you can actually implement explicit instruction. Okay, So it's still the I do, where you are modelling how to use that particular thinking tool. The we do, where you are interacting with students, asking for responses, challenging students and so forth. And then the you do, where the students would then continue the job of completing the Venn diagram, of completing the flow diagram um, independently. Yeah. So now it's your turn. I'd like you to go through that process. So pause the video here, read the instructions. It's pretty much the set of instructions that I just described on the last screen. So either pause the video here and go through that process and we can follow this up when we meet face to face. So, during this lecture, we went through the phases of explicit instruction, either the three step or the four step. You should be able to identify each of those phases. Not only should you be able to identify those phases, but you should just be able to describe the purpose of each phase, because the ultimate goal of this particular lecture is for you then be able to use the knowledge from this lecture to be able to plan the body of a lesson. Thank you.